In lesson 5.8, inverse trigonometric functions, differentiation, we'll begin by reviewing the concept of what an inverse trig function is. We'll follow that up with a few examples of where we actually use inverse trig functions to find other elementary trigonometric functions, and then we'll follow that up by learning the derivatives of these uh, six inverse trig functions. After that, of course, we'll do a couple examples using those derivatives, and that should set the stage for lesson 5.9, which you can probably imagine uh, is inverse trig functions integration. So this is an important lesson, although it's not very deep, because it sets the stage for what is going to come next. And all that being said, why don't we go ahead and begin by looking at a few examples applying inverse trig functions. Of course, to use inverse trigonometric functions, we first need to understand what the elementary trig functions do. Perhaps back in Algebra 2 or Precalculus, you learned about SOHCAHTOA. Uh, you might have learned it in a different way, but essentially, sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. That's the SO part, S-O-H. Uh, cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, C-A-H. And finally, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So if you spell all that out, uh, it does say SOHCAHTOA. Of course, I'm sure some of you have learned uh, rather that sine is, um, what is it, y over r, uh, where r represents the hypotenuse, cosine is x over r, and then tangent is y over x. It doesn't matter how you remember it, so long as you understand what these trigonometric ratios actually mean. So, uh, when we're dealing with inverse trig functions, we'll have things like this, arc cosine. And what that means is that the cosine of some angle is going to equal the square root of 2 over 2. Now, if you memorize the unit circle in previous courses, uh, you should be able to come up with real quick that the uh, angle which would yield a cosine of uh, radical 2 over 2 is, of course, just pi over 4. Um, another way of saying this is that the cosine of what equals radical 2 over 2, and that, of course, is that pi over 4. Uh, again, if you memorize the unit circle, you should know that the tangent of pi over 4 is equal to 1. And so that is our result of this example. However, if you did not uh, realize that the unit circle yielded pi over 4, or you have forgotten, or maybe you want to look at a case that's more general than just those special angles, what we can actually do is construct a triangle and then use that triangle to come up with the arc cosine of radical 2 over 2. Uh, I'm going to do that right here. And in fact, uh, I'm going to build my triangle as such. Uh, if this were on a unit circle, this triangle would be in standard position. Uh, this would be, uh, of course, our coordinate grid right here. And uh, this would represent theta. So uh, cosine of radical 2 over 2. Cosine, of course, is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And if we want to find this last side, uh, this is a right triangle, so all we really need to do is just the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, I'm not going to do the Pythagorean theorem here. You should be able to do that yourself. Uh, but if done correctly, we should find that this uh, other side over here, the opposite side from theta, if you will, is also radical 2 over 2. And so in this case, the tangent of theta is really just the opposite over the adjacent, which of course gives us 1. So here is a good way to do it if you have your unit circle memorized and you're given special angles to deal with. Uh, but here is the more general case, which is more useful, although not as fast, if you're given a special angle. Uh, but it is more general and therefore more useful. So that being said, why don't we take a look at another example uh, which does not involve a special angle. And so we will need to use the general uh, drawing a triangle method uh, for example B. Let's go ahead and take a look. So as mentioned here in example B, uh, we are going to have to actually build a triangle. We're not given one of those special angles with the radical 2s or radical 3s on it. Uh, and because of that, we will have to build a triangle in order to simplify uh, this expression here. So the question is, is the negative going to go on top or is the negative going to go on bottom? Uh, at first, it's not going to make too big of a difference. We'll build the same triangle either way, uh, essentially. 
Uh, but when we go to find the secant of our angle, it will make a difference there. So I'm going to do it the correct way. Uh, just to prove it to yourself, you can try doing it the, uh, quote, incorrect way and see what the result is. Uh, what I'm going to go ahead and tell you is that the negative should always go on top. All right, so let's call this negative 3 over positive 5. One important thing, although it's not relevant to this question, is that the hypotenuse is always going to be positive. And there's no exception there. The hypotenuse will always be positive. So uh, let me go ahead and first deal with uh, building our triangle, which will show the relationship arctangent of negative 3 over 5. Uh, of course, if I want to put this on a coordinate plane, uh, the question is, which quadrant is this triangle going to go in? Well, tangent is, of course, opposite over adjacent. And so I see that our adjacent will be positive 5, which means our triangle will be coming out in this direction. Uh, but the opposite side is negative 3, so we'll be going down there. So this will be our right triangle. Again, the opposite will be negative 3. The adjacent will be 5. And theta is always right near the uh, origin there. So. Uh, a little bit of Pythagorean theorem will tell you what the hypotenuse is. Uh, if you do this correctly, what you should get for the hypotenuse is the square root of 34. And so following from this, if I now go ahead and try to find the secant of that angle theta, which, of course, remember, theta is represented by this relation. So the secant of that, uh, remember that secant is just the reciprocal of cosine. Uh, so think of what cosine is and then just flip it around. What we'll have is the hypotenuse over the adjacent. And that is going to be the secant of arctan negative 3 fifths. So you see that when we don't have a special angle, we really need to show our relationship on a right triangle. It's not that hard to do as long as you remember Sokotoa or whichever method you like. And with that, let's go ahead and take a look at one more example, example C. Example C is going to bring up some very important concepts that we need to deal with here uh, as we're messing around with these inverse trig functions. Uh, first off, this x minus 1, that is not an angle that I'm familiar with on the unit circle. Uh, so clearly, we are going to have to build a triangle to uh, model this relationship here. However, there's a bigger problem still. Isn't arc sine, in fact, any trig function supposed to be a ratio? Well, I don't see a ratio here. This is just x minus 1. But as you might uh, figure out, we can actually fix that problem by turning this into the ratio x minus 1 over 1. And now that we've done that, we can deal with this. Of course, the top uh, will be the opposite, and the bottom will be the hypotenuse, since this is a sign that we're dealing with. So if I go ahead and make my coordinate axes here, uh, I'm going to make the assumption, since I don't know what x minus 1 is, that everything here is positive, and therefore my right triangle will be in the first quadrant. Now, this triangle might not be drawn to scale. Again, I don't know what x minus 1 is. But that is going to be the length of the opposite side of this triangle from theta. And the hypotenuse, as already said, will be 1. All right, well, now we need to find that adjacent side of the triangle. And how are we going to do that? Well, of course, Pythagoras to the rescue. And on this one, let's go ahead and work this out together. Uh, of course, we're just going to go a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Uh, I'm going to call this side right here. I'm going to call this the a, and I'll call this side the b. And if we do that, what we'll have is quantity x minus 1 squared plus b squared equals c, the hypotenuse squared. And now, all we have to do is a little bit of math, and we'll figure out what this is. Uh, I am going to expand this x minus 1 quantity squared. That'll be x squared minus 2x plus 1. Uh, I still have my b squared hanging out over here, and on the right side, just 1. So uh, let me just move some terms around here, see how this works out. Uh, since I do have a 1 on both sides, those will cancel each other out. And if I move these two terms over to the right, I'll have 2x minus x squared. So clearly, we now have that b is going to be the square root of 2x minus x squared. And I'll go ahead and write that in here so we can reference it as we are completing this problem. All right, now what we're trying to do is find the secant of theta. Remember, of course, that theta represents the uh, relationship right here. So the secant of theta, 
again, just like before, that's just the reciprocal of cosine. And so what I'm going to end up with is the hypotenuse divided by our adjacent side, 2x minus x squared under the radical. So there we go. Um, of course, uh, if you like, you can go ahead and rationalize this whole thing and uh, find a simplified version of it. Uh, but for the sake of the BC exam, I'm going to leave it as it is. Uh, and there you go. That is the secant of the arc sine of quantity x minus 1. Good times. So before we move on to example D, uh, as always, I encourage you to pause this video and try example D yourself. Uh, fortunately, it already is in ratio form, so it shouldn't be too hard to set up the triangle, and then you can go through and do what you got to do to it. So pause the video, and I'll meet you at example D in just a couple minutes. Although example D looks kind of nasty, I'm actually going to argue that this is one of the easier problems uh, on this page of notes. Uh, the arc sine of quantity x minus h divided by r, uh, clearly not a special function, and so we'll go ahead and set this up uh, in the form of a triangle. Of course, the top, again, because it's sine, will be opposite, and the denominator will be the hypotenuse. So, assuming once again that everything is positive here, since we really don't know, we'll just make that assumption, uh, our triangle will be in the first quadrant, our theta, as always, right next to the origin. And let's go ahead and put that our opposite will be x minus h and that our hypotenuse is r. Now, if this is the case, uh, once again, we need to find the adjacent side. And if we do that using Pythagorean theorem, yet again, we'll have quantity x minus h squared uh, plus our adjacent side squared equals the hypotenuse squared. Um, I'm not going to expand out the x minus h squared for the fact that uh, it's not really going to cancel or combine with anything else. There's no other x's or h's at all. So what I'll simply write is that b squared is r squared minus the quantity x minus h squared. And so what does b have to be then? Well, all I really need to do is just square root both sides. And I'll find that my adjacent side is as you see it right there. Uh, rather than rewriting it, let me uh, go ahead and draw an arrow. Good times. All right, so we're trying to find the cosine of uh, theta now. And cosine is an elementary trig function. You should be more than familiar with that. Uh, that is simply going to be adjacent, uh, which is what we just found. There is our adjacent divided by our hypotenuse. And there it is. Now, be very careful. Some people will be tempted to square root this r squared which would enable you to cancel these out. But that is not a valid operation, simply because the r squared and the quantity x minus h squared are not products of each other. So I can't separate them like that. Um, there's a subtraction sign in the middle, so i got to leave it the way it is. However, why would I want to make it any more difficult than it is anyway? Here is my final simplification. So there you go. Now, before we move on to the last two examples on these notes, we should first run over the derivatives of these inverse trig functions. Fortunately, you only need to memorize three of them, because the other three are the same, just with negatives in front of them. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let's go ahead and take a look. So, uh, without proof, I'm going to go ahead and just go ahead and tell you the derivatives of these inverse trig functions. Uh, they're not necessarily going to look like the derivatives of the regular trig functions, but that's because, well, they're not the same. So if we want to do the derivative of arc sine of u, and remember u uh, replaces whatever could be in its place, what we're actually going to get is the ratio of du, or you could write u prime if you like, uh, divided by the square root of just 1 minus u squared. So that's all it is. If you're trying to find the derivative of an arc sign, differentiate the argument of the arc sign for the numerator and the denominator to the square root of 1 minus u squared. Now, the derivative of arc cosine u is very, very, very similar to that. And that's a good thing. Uh, it's going to be the same thing, in fact, except with a negative in it. So you see that the arc sine and arc cosine have very similar derivatives. Uh, that's going to be a common thread throughout this box. So if I tell you that the derivative of arc tangent of u is simply du divided by 1 plus u squared, 
no square roots or anything fancy like that, can you figure out the derivative of arc cotangent u? You should be able to. It's actually, again, almost the same thing. We'll have negative du over 1 plus u squared. So you see, these aren't all that difficult. Um, the arc secant is perhaps a little more difficult, but it's not too bad. Uh, again, we will differentiate the argument of the arc secant on top. That'll be our du. Uh, this one, the denominator is a little uglier. Uh, we need to do the absolute value of the argument of arc secant multiplied by the square root of u squared minus 1. So you see, it does look similar to the arc sine in some ways, uh, but with that absolute value of u out front, that really does make it completely different. Uh, and of course, the arc cosecant of u uh, is going to be the same as the arc secant of u, just with a negative introduced. And so it will look like that. So with all that, uh, I will encourage you to commit the three on left to memory. Uh, just remember that the three on the right are the exact same, but with a negative in them. It will help you to commit these to memory also, because when we get to the next lesson, we're actually going to go backwards with these. So essentially, uh, you'll be given a function that looks like this that you need to integrate, and the integral of that will be arc sine. So don't just memorize it for this lesson. Memorize it for the long haul. And now that you uh, are working on memorizing them at least, let's go ahead and take a look at two last examples with this lesson. Uh, one easy and one other. Let's take a look. Here in example E, which is our first inverse trig derivative example, uh, you see that we do have a product rule that we're going to have to take care of. We do have x squared multiplied by the arctan of x. So if we want to differentiate that, we are going to have to apply, like I said, the product rule. So let's go ahead and differentiate the uh, x squared first. Of course, that will just give us 2x, and it will leave the arctan of x by itself. Uh, this time, let's go ahead and leave the x squared by itself, and we'll differentiate the arctan of x. And again, the arctan of x is simply going to be the derivative of the argument, which in this case, the derivative of x is just 1, divided by 1 plus x squared. So there is our product rule. If we want to go ahead and simplify this whole thing, what we'll end up with is 2x arctan of x plus x squared over 1 plus x squared. And that is our derivative. There's no more to it. There's no other way we can simplify it. Uh, don't be tempted to cancel out these x squareds. As you should know, that is not a legal operation uh, because the denominator is 1 plus x squared. So there is our derivative. Uh, that really was not too hard, which is good because the last one is. Let's take a look at that one right now. So here in example f, we have quite a bit of work to do. Uh, if we want to find the derivative of this, uh, this entire ugly function, perhaps we should simply start uh, with the first part here, the 25 arc sine of x over 5. Uh, I'm going to argue that's really not that difficult of a derivative. I'll leave the 25 out front. But when I differentiate arc sine of x over 5, uh, well, I need to do the derivative of the argument as the numerator. And then in the denominator, I will simply have uh, 1 minus the argument squared, which in this case will be x squared over 25. So that wasn't that difficult to do. Um, of course, I could simplify the 25 and the 1 fifth, but I'll get back to that in just a moment. Let's go ahead and deal with the second part of this here. Uh, we are going to have to use the product rule here because we do have an x and then this big, ugly square root part. So. Uh, let me start by differentiating just the x. Uh, of course, that will make the x go away and just leave us with 25 minus x squared. Uh, but if I want to differentiate the square root part, that might be a little more difficult. Uh, let's see. What I'm going to do is if I have 25 minus x squared to the 1 half, and if I want to differentiate that, so I will bring the 1 half down, I'll still have my 25 minus x squared, but that will now be to the negative 1 half power. Now, don't forget the chain rule. Uh, the derivative of the inside part of the radical is actually going to be negative 2x. So you see that uh, I can simplify a little bit here. 
the one half and the two cancel out. And if I throw the rest of all of this stuff together, what I'm going to end up with is a negative x on top. And then a square root of 25 minus x squared on the bottom. So there is my full derivative. However, this is hideous. Uh, certainly, if this were a multiple choice question, there would be no choice that would look like this. So let's do a little bit of cleanup here real quick. Uh, the 25 and the 1 fifth, those are going to mesh together to just give us 5. And as far as the bottom of this first part goes, uh, I could simplify this 1 minus x squared over 25 by simply multiplying the 1 by 25 over 25. If I do that, what I'll end up with is 25 minus x squared all over 25. And I'll come back to a little simplification there in just a moment. Uh, this part here doesn't really look like it needs any simplification yet anyway, so I'll leave it the way it is. And of course, on this last term, uh, the two negatives can turn into a plus. And so we end up with this. Now, that looks a little bit better, but it's still pretty ugly. Uh, this square root going on here, I can actually go ahead and square root the top and square root the bottom separately. And if I do that, what I'm going to end up with is a complex fraction with 5 on the very, very bottom, which, of course, if I multiply by the reciprocal, comes up to the very, very top. And so what I'm going to end up with here is 25 over the square root of 25 minus x squared. Uh, for my last term, I still have x over the square root of 25 minus x squared. And I would like to get a common denominator, if at all possible, on this middle term, so that I can throw all three of them together. So if I want my common denominator to be 25 minus x squared under a radical, well, the numerator would simply be 25 minus x squared. And you can uh, verify that for yourself, but it is the truth. And so now I can go ahead and stick the three of these terms together. And uh, what will I come up with? Well, it looks like uh, my final derivative, the 25 and the negative 25, are going to cancel out. Uh, this negative is going to turn this into a positive uh, x squared. And over here, uh, actually, I messed up earlier on somewhere. Uh, this should actually be, ah, I see where I messed up. Uh, I forgot to include this x right here. And if I did include that, this would be an x squared. And now I can combine these two terms together to end up with uh, positive 2x squared divided by the square root of 25 minus x squared. So I apologize uh, for the mistake I made there, but essentially it involved the product rule. On this one, I differentiated the x and was just left with this radical part. On the second part, I kept the x, but differentiated the radical part, and then it all went together, and it ended up actually quite nicely. So although these problems can be rather ugly, uh, if you follow through and do your whole simplifications, we'll end up with something that really, hopefully in your opinion, certainly in my opinion, is not too bad. And that, my friends, is the fun and excitement of Lesson 5.8. So, here in Lesson 5.8, uh, we haven't covered a whole lot, to be perfectly honest. We began by doing some review of inverse trig functions that you should have learned about uh, back in pre-calculus. We did a few examples uh, using those inverse trig functions. Some of them uh, we were able to just do using the unit circle, but more often than not, we did have to build a triangle and model the relationship that was going on. After we did that, we looked at the derivatives of these inverse trigonometric functions, and then followed those with a couple examples. Um, again, as I said earlier, be sure to memorize uh, that box with the derivatives in it, because that will come back when we get to lesson 5.9. Of course, they will be in absolute reverse. Uh, we'll end up with something that looks like the derivative of an inverse trig function, but we'll be integrating. So that will bring us back to our arc sine, or arc cotangent, or arc what have you. So, uh, although we didn't cover a whole lot in this lesson, what we did cover was very important and will set the stage for what's coming next. So, uh, keep all this in mind as you're working on this. Memorize those derivatives, and as always, good luck on this assignment.